appreciate you. Ah, you're good. They're washed, right? Good morning. It is good to be together. Uh, always a great day and a great opportunity to study. As I was walking in from grabbing my coffee, Sister Lee said, Oh, we're not late. Look, Jared's in here. She said, You can't be late when the teacher's not there. Um, it is good to be together. We are going to pick up in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 3. Um, as we kick off and get going, you might notice there's some baptism, uh, baptism hardware, some clothing and uh, towels up here. We've had a great week. So this past week, Shaquille was baptized Thursday, and then Sunday, Ethan, uh, Ethan was baptized. Did you get him a card? Yeah, do him a card. Grant was Sunday night. Yeah. That was Sunday night a week ago. No, this is uh, Ethan Thompson. So they sit on the back row on Sunday, on Sundays only. Mom's calling. I wonder if the deal's not working. I've got it. Uh, so they sit on the very back row. I'm trying to think of who sits there. It's in the, the middle section. Jim Burton all the way at the very, very back. It's that row, but all the way at the very, very back. Um, and they have come. Does he come by his No, his mother's always with him. And, uh... I probably wouldn't advertise it online, but uh, when, she, when she came to me and she talked, you know, he's been listening to the lessons and sitting in the class. Uh, and uh, throughout the years, they've been coming and they have come every, I would say every third Sunday or so. It's not like every Sunday, but definitely come. And so after the baptism, she said, do you remember when you knocked on my door? I was like, no. Uh, but anyway, she's been coming for like five years. I had counted her as a full-time visitor, but uh, anyways. Is it, is it your mama, a son, and a daughter? It's, to it is a son and a mom. And they live right down the road here, so... Uh, uh, everybody make sure to send out some cards this week. Grant Walensic was baptized last Sunday. Uh, we can get you his address. That was one of the cards. I know Shaq or Shaquille was baptized Thursday. I believe her address is in the bulletin. And then uh, Ethan Thompson was baptized Sunday. So... Uh, I would say that's a pretty great seven days if you were asking me. And so we want to praise God for that and uh, uh, do our best to encourage all of them. Um, good to have Jace with us. Uh, we haven't had him for a few weeks, but he sneaks in when he can. Tax season. Ooh. Uh... Taxes are over unless you filed an extension, like me. Um, but it's good to get through with them, that's for sure. Um, all right, Brother Good is supposed to be coming home today, possibly. Okay, so... Oh, no. I couldn't hardly understand what she was saying, but I think she said she was going to have to have an operation. Okay, we want to pray for Sister Kathy Taylor and uh, pray for Brother Good. And uh, we were without Jim on Sunday. Sunday we were gymless, but uh, he is back and feeling well today. Miss Rose had to go home and check on him, but... Uh, 
We're glad to have him back. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Kara Campbell, breast cancer. Treatment. Pray for Kara Campbell. Treatment. treatment for breast cancer. We definitely want to keep her in our prayers, and that's a, uh, a difficult time. So, absolutely, prayers for Miss Kara. Yes, sir. Oh man. Uh, you spent about two and a half weeks in the hospital back here. Wow. And uh, but they still don't know what's causing her problem. That's Chamisha? Chamisha, yeah. All right, pray for her. Hopefully we can get some answers and get figured out what's going on and get her on the right track. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Jackie Bradford, uh, she has had um, open heart surgery. She's in the hospital now. She had surgery again. And um, she has several more surgeries pending. She had six arteries that were 50 to 100% blocked. Wow. So she's had a second surgery. Wow. So we want to pray, pray for that recovery process and uh, six six arteries that mainly blocked so mainly or majorly one of the two uh anybody else yes sir miss gloria sick but getting better she's on the men miss drury we got us a meal tomorrow don't we what's on the menu tomorrow If you haven't already signed up, you better try and sweet talk Miss Drury. It might be too late. I don't know what to tell you. If I didn't sign up, make sure I'm signed up. I can't say no to port. There's no Jew inside me. All right. Um, which I would be there either way. How's Harley doing? Is Harley feeling better, Miss Annette? Okay. Okay. I was thinking that I had heard she was better. I don't remember seeing her, but I... I'm glad to hear she's doing well. All right. Anybody else? You like it? Funny story. I lost some years. Uh, so I was, uh, I was working on the four-wheeler. It wouldn't start. And so I sprayed a little starting fluid in it, and it backfired. It smelled really funny, and I went inside, and I had to trim off the rest that was left. <laughs> Win some, you lose some. I'm only half the man I was last week. <laughs> hmm. All right, anybody else? That's right. See, if it wasn't for that beard, I'd have a burnt face. So we got to be thankful for a beard. All right, uh, let's see. Brother Shed, would you mind open us with a prayer today and then we'll get Raymond to lead us in a song. Amen. All right, what are we going to sing today, Brother Raymond? The joyful sound. The joyful sound. Here we go. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Bad news is every man. Bad news in the west. Onward is the Lord's command. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. And the church said, 
Amen. All right. And man, did we miss you when you weren't here. I had to say it myself that week you weren't here. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So we got through the first two verses and it took a little bit, but we're going to speed up some as we go through the next few verses. In verse 3 he says, grace, oh never mind, somebody go ahead and read verse 3. We'll get started. Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. Now, there are certain things, certain phrases that you can uh, apply to different groups. So, uh, myself, having lived in the North, we often said, hey, or hey, guys, or hey, uh, hello. Now, you move down to the south and you say, hello, y'all, or hey, y'all, or howdy, or maybe that's more Texas, I don't know. But anyways, there are different phrases that are known or tied to different groups of people. It's a proper greeting that is accustomed to a group. Now, when you look at verse 3, grace is a common Grecian greeting. Okay, at the same extent, when he says grace to you and peace from God, peace from God would be a common uh, greeting for those that would have been of the, the Jewish background. It would have been a common hello, a common, uh, common greeting. So when he says, and he ties together, grace and peace, grace to you and peace, uh, there is a tie to both groups. Hey, y'all, and howdy. Hi, guys, and hey, y'all. Uh, no matter what background or group you came from, you felt a personal connection to what Paul is relaying to them. So he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Now, you can see the tie within everything that... Uh, Paul does one of the, the tests of authenticity or the uh, tests of inspiration requires that tie back to God. And Paul is going to do that on many occasions. So here, once again, he says this peace and grace that is offered comes from God our Father. And he says, and the Lord Jesus Christ. You have the tie to both leaning or linking to the inspiration, and the God-sent message that we begin 1 Corinthians with. And so as you get down through the first three verses, I would say we get the encapsulation of the greeting. The greeting was to all groups. Why would it be important to recognize Jews and Greeks when he gives a greeting at Corinth? Because they're one under that umbrella of Christ. They're... Uh, they are both included and they're both going to feel a personal connection to the gospel through what he says here, which uh, we recently studied Romans. And as you go throughout Romans, the common, common theme is recognizing the bringing together of the gospel uh, for all men. All right, so we get down to verse 4. Somebody go ahead and read verse 4. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, he caught, caught both groups. Uh, yeah, even, even in Corinth, he did the same thing. And as we know, it's like a, a Mecca or a major trade center. Like you're going to have all groups of people, all walks of life uh, would kind of converge into one. Verse 4, somebody go ahead and read that. All right, he thinks God always concerning you. Now, when we introduce Corinth or Corinthians, we introduce the church at Corinth, what did we notice as a main theme as we went throughout, a book, throughout the book? Yeah, what did we notice about the church at Corinth? 
it was all messed up. It was full of problems. You start out chapter 1, not united, and it continues. Uh, there is a constant battle of what needs correction as you go throughout Corinth. But, Notice what he says in verse 4 with these people that are all messed up. I thank my God always concerning you. Okay? We see here that Paul was still thankful for the messed up people. All right, understanding that we, uh, as individuals are fallible. It's possible that we mess up. Uh, you can see there's a certain patience that Paul shows in dealing with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Do they have problems? Absolutely. Does he still thank God for them? He sure does. Yes, sir. That's exactly right. Value on everything that God made. Mm -hmm. And here Paul shows that. So you can go, these people all messed up, but he thanked God on their behalf. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was super thankful for them. Yeah. Uh, they're trying. Were they messed up? Yeah. Uh, but he recognized that they had that goal in mind as they, uh, as they looked to heaven and... The purpose of Cor the, the Corinthian letter, the first Corinthian letter, is let's get this right. Let's see, let's see if we can't, uh, we can't get you more firmly planted or aimed towards the goal. And uh, this is going to be, as you look here, he thanks, his, thanks God for them. This is a common theme that uh, Paul did as... He speaks to any of his letters. As you look at the different letters that he wrote, uh, it's very common for him to recognize his thanks for them. Look at Philippians, for example. Philippians chapter 1, as he starts out the, the letter there. Somebody read verse 3 and 4. All right, was he thinking about prayer? Was he thinking about them when he prayed? Yes. Uh, look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Now you could look through many others. These are the only two I'm going to look at. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 2 through 4. All right. Once again, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers or in prayers. Uh, as you look at, uh, you know, we look at uh, Paul as he writes, pray without ceasing. It seems very evident that Paul was a prayerful man. Uh, he was continually uh, thanking God for these brothers and sisters. He remembers them in prayer as he starts out in Corinth. He remembers these people that uh, aren't perfect, that are fallible, that uh, need correction. And yet he says, I thank my God for you. And so, despite the sinful condition that was prevalent in the congregation, uh, prayers were still offered. Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, he said, I thank God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus. Within, uh, within this picture in 1 Corinthians, as you consider the problems that they had, you really see a picture of long-suffering. 
Did he continue to care for the people that were messed up? Absolutely. Look at Romans chapter 2, verse 4. All right, the, the long-suffering of God, the goodness, the forbearance of God, and he says, ultimately, it ended or it completed where? In repentance. Uh, it finished with repentance. What is the purpose in 1 Corinthians when Paul is writing his letter? Pleading for them to repent. He said, look, I'm here to tell you the truth. He counts them as a brother, but he says there's still some stuff that needs to be corrected. And uh, that is the goal there. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. <clears throat> Somebody read verse 18 through 21 if you're feeling spry. All right, we get back to the example, and when God could find none that were righteous, save Noah and his family, the long-suffering of God still did what? It gave him time. It allowed him, it, it allowed Noah the opportunity to do exactly what God wanted him to do to save his people. And when I say save his people, I'm still, I'm looking forward to coming of the Christ. Christ was going to come through Noah uh, and salvation was going to come to those. Uh, uh, <clears throat> well, here it says in verse 20, uh, those that accepted or went through the water. Uh, he used the water to save Noah and his family. Not that the water was special, it was just regular old H2O. But just the same thing happens today. Not that the water is special, but the obedience that they did and the, the obedience that we have, we see salvation comes about through it. I think Carolyn Lee's up. And uh, he actually was given them an opportunity to repent. Absolutely. The ones that, uh, you know, yep. Yeah, as Noah did his preaching, and, a, and yet they didn't change. Yes, sir. You know, the scripture says that those eight souls were saved by, saved by water. Uh, not that they were in the water. It's that, that the water lifted the boat mm -hmm. off the earth. Mm -hmm. Because anything that was left on the earth was supposed to die. Yeah. So the water lifted the boat out of danger. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, the obedient were saved by water. At the same extent, those that are not faithful, what? They were destroyed by the same water. Why? Because they were disobedient. They didn't follow the outline that God gave. Uh, Noah was told to build an ark. He got on the ark. He did what God said. He was told that everything on earth would die. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. If you was on the earth, you would touch the ground. You would die. That's right. So, uh, your, yes, sir. Most of your denominations today preach or teach that uh, you're, you're first saved and then as an obedience to God, you're baptized. And it's actually reversed that you should show uh, uh, obedience first by baptism 
and then through the baptism of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, then you're saved. Mm -hmm. And that's where the denominations have it all backwards. Well, and I think as you look at 1 Peter 3, 1 Peter 3 has to be one of the easiest places to grasp it. Noah and his family were what? Saved through the water. He says, in the like figure, in the same way, today you are saved through water. Uh, not that the water's special. We don't have any miracle drug in the water. But we contact the blood of Christ through that water. Why? Because we're obedient to the plan. Uh, through faith. That's exactly right. Uh, I, think, uh, I think when it's your turn to stand before God, they'll say, through faith, you were obedient in being buried in the water where you contact the blood of Christ. And there are many in the world that confuse it, but there are too many times as you look throughout Scripture... You would think once would be enough that points out the, uh, the purpose. Uh, you know, Acts 2.38, wash away our sins. You know, you, you would think that you could tie repentance and baptism and say, well, that just makes sense. But over and over throughout Scripture, he points to it. And yet, you've got to wonder how people don't grasp it. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Which is foolish. I mean, I looked at a Bible one time that had some commentary. I always go look at Acts 2.38 just to see what it says. Go look at Mark 16.16, 16, see what it says. Look at Acts chapter 8, see what it says. Uh, if you are being realistic, if someone went on a journey in the desert in Acts chapter 8, they carried a little can of, canister of water. If all they needed to do was sprinkle a little water on his head, there was enough left in the bottom of the jug even if they drank it all. If all you had to do was pour a little water on his head, tip the jug up and don't worry about it. But instead, it says they went down into the water. Why? Because in Romans 6, 3, it's a burial. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, I always say, why would anybody want to walk around with wet underwear? I can't stand wet underwear. In Acts chapter 8, if it wasn't necessary that they went down into the water, he could have scooped a little water up in his hand and dumped on him. But it is not what the scriptures say. It's not what the scriptures teach. And the facts are there is a burial. Why? Because Jesus Christ was buried in the tomb. That's why. All right. He rose and we rise. Second Peter chapter 3. One more verse on the long suffering of God. Somebody read verse 9. Just one verse. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Long suffering, not willing that any should perish. He didn't want anybody to miss out. The long-suffering of God. You look at the long-suffering of Paul as he starts out the Corinthian letter. He said, I thank my God for you, making mention of you in my prayers. The, uh, the idea is uh, we are to be a long-suffering people. Uh, as Christians, we want to extend mercy. We want to extend grace. Because as you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, we see this picture of long-suffering as he considers his people, and then he extends grace at the end of the verse. He says, For the grace of God which was given you by Jesus Christ. 
the grace of God being extended to these people. Who? People that are troubled. People that have problems. The Lord's not slack concerning His promises. But He's long-suffering. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The idea is God wants all to repent. And uh, part of the purpose here is He's saying, Hey, you got to fix these, these little deals. These little things going on, we got to get that right. we got to take care of it. Uh, we want to remove uh, anything that is amiss. Uh, yes, ma'am. Hmm. Uh, you have to realize environment. They've been in that environment at all these. You know, the church is just coming in. So they are just uh, uh, subjects of their environment. So it's just a natural thing to them. Yeah, as you say that, I mean, I would say to a large extent, maybe they don't grasp all of it, but a uh, word is brought back to Paul, which would also lend to somebody knows. Uh, I imagine some are and some aren't. Uh, whether or not every person knew, uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we know that word came back, so it had been at least spoken of. Uh, I would like to think that if it had been spoken of, that it had been spoken to the person. Uh, but the idea is uh, there needs to be correction. And so Paul sets out with his purpose to set things right, set it straight. Mm, I don't get the impression that they sent for him. Go down, let's look at verse 10 and 11. Uh, he says in verse 10, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Why? Because, verse 11, For it has been declared to me, Concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Uh, so at least as this, this first thing comes, it would seem as though at least all we're aware. I mean, there's contentions among you. Uh, surely if there's a contention, they recognize it, they knew. Uh, Chloe's household knew. And he says... Uh, Mm -hmm. And so Chloe's household made sure that Paul knew, saying, like, look, this ain't right. Uh, they haven't settled it, maybe, so to speak. Later we're going to talk about taking your, your brother to, to court. Uh, how, come we can't, how come we can't be the judge? He goes back, chapter 6. Uh, he says in chapter 6, don't you understand that... Uh, Uh, let's see, verse 2. Do you not know that saints will judge the world? Okay, the world's going to be condemned for their deeds in opposition to the deeds that uh, those who are faithful have, all right? Noah condemned the world, not in that Noah said, oh, I hate these people, but rather in the fact that Noah choose to, chose to do right and his deeds saved him. Saints are going to be in the same place. He says, so, 
if you as saints will judge the world, and if the world be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Like, can't you all settle this together? Uh, rather than making a spectacle of the church, which is realistically what happens there in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 is, look, when you go to, go to the world with your problems, you're just airing out, look, it, we're messed up. Uh, it's, you know, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Well, that's completely opposite. They'll wonder what you are by your hate. Uh, and so, so that's... I mean, I would say that's the, absolutely the case in Matthew 18. Uh, you know, when there is conflict, it starts with going together. We've got to get together and we've got to settle it. We've got to get this right. Don't bring any outside. Don't bring in anybody else. But rather there is one-on-one -on -one interaction. In Matthew chapter 18, he goes on to say, if they couldn't settle it, he said at the mouth of a couple witnesses. You know, you can bring two people in. The, the church is going to judge the world. Saints judge the world, 1 Corinthians 6, 2. So why can't we just figure this out amongst ourselves? So you bring in two witnesses that says, now wait, you're, you're wrong on that. You're going too far. That's beyond the, uh, that's beyond the, uh, the scope of what's right. Okay, everybody agrees. Well, you're wrong. Okay, well, if I'm wrong, uh, you know, and the deal is they need to show it through God's word, but they come to an agreement on, okay, maybe I've, I've just taken too big of a step. And then ultimately, if there is no agreement after two witnesses or a couple witnesses, uh, a couple or a few, uh, one or two, one or two. Uh, I think it's Matthew 18, one or two. You know, we, we have to recognize the self-economy of the church. If there's conflict today, all answers, all resolutions to conflict in this church. And uh, now, as, as far as the Corinthian ch uh, church back then, how much time Both. did Paul spend Verse 16. Uh, there in Corinth? How much time? A year so, and a half. How much? A year and a half. Yep. A year and a half. Mm -hmm. a year and a half of teaching that's coming from, from the Holy Spirit directed to Paul by revelation. Those people knew. Mm -hmm. But it's just like today. You might know and not understand, or you might understand and don't want to know. Mm -hmm. But they knew it was the nature of the people. They had not been reborn. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the same thing today. I mean, you might have somebody that's been in the church, that's been studying, been a, been a member of the church for 20 years, but there's still things there. There's areas where we can all grow. And uh, the idea is we continue to grow. Profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, instruction in righteousness. It's all right here. Mm -hmm. So if, if we have a conflict, how, what do I, we need to send uh, to uh, South Haven to resolve something here when we got the judge and the jury right here? Right. Well, I think the design in Matthew 18 was that it would be within the church and each church being autonomous, it's obvious that... Uh, You've got one or two witnesses in Matthew 18 so that at the mouth of two or three, uh, every word can be established. They can say, okay, we've come to a understanding. You go on, he says, well, if you can't figure it out then, who do you go to? The world? No, the church. All right, that doesn't mean the church worldwide. It means the church. We are the church uh, as we gather together. Uh, so we don't have to go to some outsider, you know, within the... Uh, Within the Catholic religion, they got to where they had a person that's a head honcho, that's in charge. We call him the Pope, so to speak. Uh, that's not found within God's Word. There was, there was the authority in Scripture, but you have, when he talks about the church, it's the group, the assembly, the ecclesia, the called out, uh, and it being the, the saints, those that... Uh, the, Jared, I, I go through a lot of little towns sometimes, and you can see different denominations. 
denominations, associations, you know, mm -hmm. that they work at different levels. Uh, and and we, we got it all right here in the book. <laughs> we've, got, we've got everything we need. We don't have to have all that. Yeah. Yeah. Also, yes, sir. They did not have this completed written word. Which is exactly where we go with verses 5 through 7. Yep, and verses 5 through 7, is that's exactly where Paul's headed with the, with the book right now. Before he gets to be united on it, he describes how they get their authority or where they find what they ought to do. And uh, so he's going to talk about spiritual gifts for just a little bit before he goes into correcting uh, the division that's among them. Sister Benita, you raising your hand? Yes, ma'am. I think her question was, do, and uh, I know it was said about autonomy and stuff, but she was saying that they sent outside of their congregation and got Paul. Yeah. And she was They're questioning. They're asking somebody. And she said in the faith, not, not necessarily in the congregation is what right. she was saying. That, That's you know, though outside there is autonomy the and all of that that they got Paul, who was not currently a member there mm -hmm. in the church, to come. And so that was her question. Is that the pattern today? Do we do that? If there is something... I mean, I don't think it's wrong to go ask others for... Look, give me some, some, some biblical guidance. Mm -hmm. uh, now, as far as like... Going around and asking, like, I don't, I don't know that it makes any difference if South Haven were to say, uh, well, well, I have Mike, Mike or Jared or, you know, the elders. Like, it makes no difference. They have no authority. Now, if you wanted to ask as far as, uh, as, far as biblical understanding, you could absolutely check with any Christian, period. Now, when you're talking about Paul... Obviously, he's already, he's been there amongst them. It's not like this was removed from him. Uh, he's, you might say, a full-time missionary at this point. Uh, and so, not to mention, at the same extent, he was fully inspired and or he had, uh, he had miraculous gifts. He didn't lack miraculous gifts in view of any of the other apostles, he had everything that they had. Uh, now we're going to see the miraculous gifts that was amongst the congregation as we go down through. But uh, as far as okay, so I would say First Corinthians, sorry, Matthew, Matthew eighteen. No, I don't think you go to a different congregation to uh, to uh, take your accusation to to them now as far as understanding i think it's absolutely profitable to talk to or discuss with those outside the congregation that you know are members of the body of christ uh biblical Yeah, scholars, you can find somebody that's just somebody that's very knowledgeable. Uh we're going to get down into verse uh 5 some of these people 
were enriched in everything by him in all utterance. Okay, we're going to find out he's referring to spiritual gifts, I imagine, within utterance. Very likely, we're just talking about uh, this ability to speak in tongues so they could utter words that an outsider couldn't understand. So we have utterance, and then he says knowledge. Now, when he says all knowledge in verse 5, I think he all, by implication not to mention when you tie in verse 7, we understand that it's a miraculous knowledge, not just a, uh, oh yeah, I know that. Uh, we can know things, but they knew things. Like they had a miraculous portion of knowledge uh, that he's going to be talking about in verse 5. Does that kind of answer? It does, because if you remember, that's really the approach that I had when I first came here. Mm-hmm. Asking questions, seeking, yes. seeking knowledge. To unresolved issues. Mm-hmm. How to approach it mm-hmm. from a spiritual mm-hmm. that kind of mm-hmm. That's why I have. Right. Yeah, I think that's... Right. Well, and still, I would say no one knew any details. It's just uh, knows there's questions. Okay, that's questions, but that's still not the details of the matter, which is the idea in Matthew 18. I don't think it's wrong to seek advice or counsel uh, in the multitude of counselors. Uh, if you go back to Proverbs, the idea of having getting wise advice is a wise person uh, as you seek out uh, wise advice. Uh, I, was, I was thinking that uh, in mind of the, uh, the church, because there was conflict of the church, which you involve another church to get an answer, not right. an indi- individual. An individual can go wherever the, the answer is and get it. Mm-hmm. You know? But uh, no, but I was thinking of a church that will right. go under the authority of another right. church. Yeah, we're not going to, we're obviously not going to uh, rule on a matter at a congregation that is not Olive Branch. Like, the, the elders rule at Olive Branch, and when I say rule, they shepherd, they lead, they guide, they uh, watch out for the souls of Olive Branch. Uh, they're not going to go to a different congregation and take that lead role. Even if they think the other congregation's wrong, it's not that they have the, the right to go in and say, well, you did this. And uh, it can't be the case. Now, I'm not saying individually you couldn't call somebody and be like, look, I heard that this was going on. You know, that's not right. Uh, But they don't have the authority as far as, well, we're going to make rules for your congregation. And they are this, 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 this. Uh, Ultimately, they're to be ruled by the Bible. And if the other congregation respects God's word, then I would like to think that we could come to verse, verse 10 and we can speak the same things and we'd be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment based on this. Okay, as you go down through 1 Corinthians, you get into verse 5, 6, and 7, and he talks about the inspiration that was used to show that it was divine teaching, all right? That it was God's Word that was coming through. Now, we're going to look at 5, 6, and 7 next week, but we're going to try and finish 4 this week. Uh... But the idea being they could agree upon God's word. Uh, And that's what he says in verse 10. I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the name of the Lord, by the authority of Christ, that you speak the same thing. How? Because in John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Uh, the idea being, if we're united on Christ, then we should be able to come to a proper conclusion or an equal understanding, a oneness that he's talking about there. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, at the very end, notice he says that it comes to them, he talks about the grace of God which was given you by Christ Jesus. All right, as you talk about the grace of God, it comes by or through Christ. When you talk about the grace of God, ultimately, I think we are leaning towards having view salvation. All right, the grace of God prepared or made a way so that we could be saved, that we can enjoy, uh, that we can enjoy salvation in Christ. 
Acts chapter 4 verse 12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. All right, you're not going to find salvation outside of Christ. You're not going to find salvation outside of Christ's words. You talk about uh, the religious world today. There's lots of people that have creeds or uh, books, manuals that they might follow. Okay? Outside of Christ, you cease to be, you cease to find, Acts chapter 4, verse 12, salvation. There's only one name. There's only one authority through which we can attain or reach, uh, enjoy the grace of God that brings about salvation. Look at 1 Timothy 2. 1 Timothy 2. Go ahead and read verse 4 and 5, if you like. Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth? For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Amen. Who desires all men. Go back to verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. All right? How is it that they enjoyed salvation? How is it that they come to that knowledge of truth? Through a study of God's Word, through the authority of Christ. You go back to Matthew chapter 28. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, he says, All authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. All right? That was a God-given authority. Uh, he didn't take it, and then he goes on to teach uh, what it is that they are to do. He tells them to, in verse 19 to go make disciples of all nations. He tells them in verse 20 uh, to, to teach those that had already been baptized in verse 19. Teach them to observe all things. What's he teaching them? The words of Christ. Go back to John chapter 12 and verse 48 where Jesus says, The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. How do we reach this grace that he's talking about? We dig into the word. You go back to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. It fits perfectly with uh, the design there when he says, Look, you ain't earning it. This ain't your wages. It's not what you deserve. It says, For by grace you've been saved. He goes on to say, and that not of yourselves, not because of deserve, not because I worked so hard, not because I put in my time, I did my 40 hours this week, no. He said, not of works. It's the gift of God. He goes on to say in verse 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. You ain't got nothing to boast about. Luke chapter 17, verse 10. When it's all done, recognize what? I'm an unprofitable servant. Praise be to God that I get to serve. Yes. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you read all that, you'll see that Christ is mentioned just by in every verse. Mm -hmm. He is solidifying Christ. Mm -hmm. And all things Christ. So, uh, I, I think and he solidifies it before he deals with the problems. That's right. He says, recognize Jesus. Look to Jesus. The authority that was God-given to Jesus. All right, he reply, He repeats it over and over and over before he's going to get into verse 10 where he says, Now I plead with you. I beg of you. Let's take care of this. Uh, let's, let's stamp out or stomp out the problems uh, that are going on at Corinth. Yes, ma'am. Aww. 
and for your life. Mm -hmm. You need to yield to me. Come, let us reason together. You can have it. You can have the food. I think back to the woman at the well. He says, look. He said, you know, you, you don't know. She said, you don't know who you're asking. He said, look, if you understood the water that I have, uh, there is a provision made, uh, Psalm 23, my cup runneth over. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, filled up with it, consumed with it. Uh, you know, I think about the Pillsbury Doughboy. It's like, you want to be so full of God's Word that when they poke you, a woo hoo a verse comes out. All right, guys, love you all. We're going to pick up in verse 5 next week. Next week we're going to try and get through verse 7. I believe we'll do it because we really need to group verse 5 through 7 together uh, as you look at the, uh, the miraculous. So... Appreciate everybody being here. We're glad to have uh, Billy back with us. The water is running, but not all over the house, and that's a good thing. And so we're glad to have him with us. Brother Gaines, do you mind dismissing us today? Do you mind doing closing prayer? Amen. Hi, Mike Hickson here. Thank you for spending the last hour with us. We hope that our service, the time that we've spent together, has been profitable to you. We'd love to have you come and be with us in person. Please come every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for Bible study, 10 a.m. for worship. We meet again on Sunday afternoon at 1 p.m. And then Tuesday morning, we have a very special class. We meet at 10 a.m. And then Wednesday night, midweek Bible study at 7 p.m. Please come and be with us. Hope to see you soon. God bless.